I am so excited. I have an ultimate entrepreneur, Talmud Spicer. He is the CEO of the Uncle Sonny Project. Welcome to The Playbook, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an honor. I'm so excited. Well, you know, it's so much fun for me because I get to do a little due diligence on everyone that comes on the show. And there's certain souls that I think are just so aligned uh, with my journey and my perception. And it seems to me that you, uh, in your career, had a quantum shift of perception. <laughs> that you started to realize that you give meaning to what you see and uh, you even use, utilize a term called the perceptionist, I think, or something like that, uh, along with audiobooks, free books, podcasts. You know, how and when did you find that you had control of your perception? I think it, it all stemmed back in, in 2014, right, when I realized that what I was doing was not going to get me to my goal, when my goal suddenly became overcome $150,000 in student loan debt, right? <laughs> Um, they they wanted me to pay four thousand dollars a month on the hardship program, and the regular nine to five. I just didn't see it, you know, fulfilling that 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 task. And I don't with any after folks. tax dollars, by the way. Yes, a lot of people don't know. You know, student loans are after tax dollars, so we're looking about mm -hmm. eight thousand a month. Right, that's the hardship. Yes, that's the hardship. <laughs> we're, we're helping you out. You know, take right. it easy. I know your life first hundred is hard. grand goes to us. Yeah, Oof. and it was tough. Um, so I jumped in the books, I started expanding my mind and I realized that with these new ideas, I was getting the first big book being uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that who I was, was shifting. I was opening up. I was more aware. I was more capable. I was, uh, you know, just seeing things in a different way. And that was my first, uh, you know, experience with mindset and perception and the, the capabilities of it. And my journey since then has been tremendous, tremendous, and it's, it's still changing, forever changing with new experiences. Um, and with those experiences, it seems there's always an evolution that we start with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich, you know, different books that, you know, change the way we look at business, gives it a more belief type of, uh, mm -hmm. of an attitude other than what we've learned in great business schools like Fairleigh Dickinson that you went to or other people I know that go to Stanford, Harvard, Penn, Wharton. And yet it is the power of the mindset that then also changes uh, this intuition. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have written a book about intuition, mm -hmm. uh, about trusting your gut and being gutless. <laughs> um, you know, how have you learned that the gut, this feeling, this intuition is relative to the mindset that you learn from, you know, a rich dad, poor dad, or a think and grow rich? Right. I, I think that because there's something out there, I believe that there's something bigger than us at play, right? That we're tapped into this energetic field and the way we communicate with it is through feeling and emotion, right? And that, is, that plays heavily in your gut. That's where it happens. Right. So you have this inkling, right, that I should go this way and that way looks scary. Right. So we avoid it and we already know what happens when you avoid it. We can look at the statistics. We can look at the average lifestyle. People are living unfulfilled, unmeaningful lives because they're afraid to go without. They need to survive. We need to provide for our kids. And I don't want to say that that's not important. However, there is something on the other side of that fear when you follow your gut. And, and I think it's, a, it's also important to say while we're on the matter that your gut is like that GPS and it needs to be set first, right? You need to have a destination first. So you have to kind of have an idea of what is your ideal situation. And once you, once you build a relationship with that, with this vision, a greater vision for yourself, your gut is gonna take you straight to it. It's amazing because you know in that book, have the guts to follow your guts. And then while playing it safe is the biggest risk of all, you know, having the guts to follow your guts determines, I think, people getting confused on how do I know what that gut feeling is? Mm -hmm. You know, because you get it when you're taking a test, right? A or B. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we've all taken so many different tests that have multiple choice on it. And you get so confused because all of a sudden your gut starts contradicting itself. Or is that your gut contradicting itself? And is there a timing to know when you have a decision to make where your gut is making the decision or where your mind is making the decision? I, I think that, you know, the way we're set up, it's going to be in alignment. Like your gut doesn't work without your mind. Your mind doesn't work without your gut, right? 
And when you think that your gut is supposed to knock everything out the park right there in these micro situations, it's important to zoom out, right? Because a lot of the times the things don't make sense until like hindsight, hindsight is twenty twenty. It doesn't make sense looking into the future. I thought that uh, I needed to pass this test so that I can become a doctor or something like that. And my gut said, pick C and I failed the test, but now, I'm a musician or something like that. You know, you don't really know what is going to to happen or what is meant for you. But in in those moments, your gut, I think, is guiding you to your ultimate good. And you don't really get to piece that together until the thing is done. Which I love and which is why I wanted to have you on the podcast is that very few people can articulate what I think is the foundation of my decision-making process. And I've written a lot of books about decision-making. I talk about decision-making. And you started there by saying, hey, I believe there's something bigger than me. Mm -hmm. An omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source. But there's a missing component that you believe as well, which you just described, that not only must you believe there's something bigger than you, but you must believe that at all times, that omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, loves you as much as your mom loves you or you love your own children. Therefore, when you pick the wrong answer or what you perceive to be the wrong answer because mm -hmm. the Scanatron said it was B, not C, right. that according to the omniscient, all-powerful and all-knowing who loves you more says, no, 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 for your journey, mm -hmm. C's the right answer because if you did B, you'd be stuck in a job and be miserable, divorced, whatever else is gonna happen to you because you're constantly mm -hmm. promoted and protected. Even in the microcosmic incident, it seems as if you've been misled, mistreated, punished even, or even victimized. But yet, often what seems to be victimization and punishment is promotion and protection. Uh, how can we have the faith, not only in the gut, but who the gut talks to, which I believe the gut is talking to, the omniscient, all-powerful, and all-knowing. How can we have that faith that when we miss the test or break up with our girlfriend or don't get the job or get an illness even, that that's occurring for a bigger or better purpose? Right, I, I think that it's a practice. Mm. It's a practice, there's no, there's no, faith button that you could just hit and you know you're, you're just walking by faith and not by sight but there is a, a reason I, I think that if you start with your why right if you start with a vision and why that vision is important to you then you can start to say okay this is meant for me and that that belief alone will trickle into uh, a need to reiterate to reprogram to say like good things do happen to me why because it's important that they do because if they don't, then, then for me, you know, if I speak about myself, it's it's a a tug of war between living for full, fulfilled and living a, a meaningless life. You know, I, I came to the realization uh, during my journey that living on a day to day basis is a choice. You know, there is an option to take your life. And that's very real. So if I was going to stay here, if I was going to choose to be here. I need to do it for a meaning, right? For a purpose that is bigger than me. And the only way I saw myself being successful in that is believing that I would be. Because you don't go into a basketball th game thinking that you're gonna lose and then expect to win, you, you just don't. Um, and then when you get there, you also get to play with fear too. You know, because fear is a is obviously a, a big hurdle to having that type of faith, the type of faith that you need to live a life by design. And we get to sit with it. We let to let those feelings, those emotions, those anxieties, those regrets come up and we address them. And through the, that practice of one, feeding your faith, addressing and uh, starving your fears, that's where you get that that type of conviction that, that takes you to success. And between feeding the faith and avoiding fear or you know somehow reconciling that uh, is risk. Right. You know, people's perception of faith and people's perception of fear determine the quantitative value that they're placing upon risk. And a lot of people don't take the time to figure out their own timing and risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. Yet what they're doing is adhering the decisions and actions in their lives, according even to the highest decision of whether I want to live today or not, which is your decision uh, based upon one thing, risk. And that's the ultimate perception. 
and how do you reconcile that risk with your faith and fear? Mm -hmm. uh, because that risk will determine whether or not you can move forward, backwards or sideways. Right, right. I, I think that when it comes to building a relationship with risk, it's it's all about awareness, right? Is it's to to somebody who is financially literate, making a bigger investment isn't as much of a risk as somebody who has no clue what they're doing, right? And I think that a lot of us that haven't you know exposed ourselves to to risk. Uh, live in a place where we already believe that the world is against us, that we're going to lose. And we can't afford to put ourselves in a situation to lose any more than we've already had. But if you, you realize that risk is, is involved and the only missing key is your education, your exposure, your awareness, then get excited. We get to jump out of planes and we get to do all the crazy things and you know we get to actually have a life to live. And to take a risk, a lot of times, uh, it's a lot easier when we have uh, one of three people in our lives, a mentor, which I believe shares their experience with us, a coach, which brings the best out of us, or a teacher that can explain to us how best to do something. Mm -hmm. And all three can be in one person, or you can utilize three different people that have those skills and that knowledge in order to effectuate the higher potential or desire that you have. How important was coaching, mentoring, and teaching uh, from you know where you started in 2014, graduating with you know all of those $150,000 worth of loans, the the, the hardship <laughs> of eight grand a month. Uh, but you know you weren't by yourself, and you seem to whether it be from after reading Rich Dad Poor Dad or some other books, realize that mentorship, coaching, and teaching was going to be an integral part of not only you for as the student but also you as, as the coach. Right, it, it's played a monumentous role in my life because what, what mentors do, what coaches do, is they facilitate that awareness, that exposure to different ideas, to different perspectives and ways of doing things where you are limited to do for yourself. They say, well, one of the, the uh, quotes that come to mind, one of the ideas that, that come to mind when you, when you bring that up is that you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Right? Yes, sir. So how do you get a new way of thinking without, you know, without a, an external source that's going to provide that that exposure to it? And, and I think that's where mentors step in. And they, they're the ones that sitting at the top of the mountain with a different outlook. And they say, look, I know that you feel this way. I know that you're thinking this way. I used to as well. But what would happen if you looked at it this way and then you light up? And it's like, wow, a whole new perspective, a whole new approach. You try it out. Now you have the experience. Yeah, I believe it was Einstein, right, that said you can't solve a problem in the same consciousness that it was created. Mm -hmm. And those mentors, coaches and teachers create that new consciousness that allow us to have or elevate our awareness. Um, but yet we don't know what we don't know. Right. And, you know, you're you're an artist. Uh I believe that art itself is an expression of God. Genius itself is an expression of God. It's the ability to get out of our own, our own way and clear the interference of the ego. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're talking about listening to your gut, following your gut and not being afraid, the ego is built to create fear. That's a fact. It, you know, and if you live your life like me to end all limitations and knowing that the embodiment is the ultimate limitation, uh, we have to understand how the ego works to allow ourselves to express the genius or express God through us. Mm -hmm. For you, how has that relationship worked with your ego? Because you have such a great handle with your audio book, your free book, everything that you're going to provide to everybody with ego, really. And mm -hmm. that seems to be the missing component in our conversation is what relationship do you have to have with ego if you're going to assess risk? deal with your gut as well as have the right mindset. Right. I really appreciate the way you frame that question because I think a lot of people in this space, we talk about ego death. We talk about getting rid of your ego, but instead you said, how do you manage it? How do you build a relationship with it? And I think uh, that's better because it, you do carry an ego regardless of if you- As long like as you have a body, you got an ego. Exactly. That's what it was it's, built for. Right. And, and resistance to that truth is is misery yeah. right? because it's, it's not going to change. Um, with me, I, I think there was a point in my life where I realized I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I was outside of my friends, my family, my, uh, 
my environment that I grew up in until I moved to Idaho and needed to figure out who I was going to be. And the ego is such a, it probably the biggest part of your human identity that you have to break it down that you realize that a lot of the things that I believe, a lot of the things that I think that I am are because of you know, society, because of my family, because of my community. They defined me up until that point. So my relationship with my ego shifted when I realized that it's made up. It's a it's a hallucination. You know, I, I get to be who I want to be, who my higher self says that I am or whatever the case. I get to play the role I want to play and realizing that also brought me to a place where I know that I can live a life that I want to live based on who I'm being. Last question. When you come to the realization, that self-realization that you can be whatever you want, that we give meaning to everything that we see, that we create the risk, we create the limitations, we create the shortages, voids, and obstacles, as well as the opportunities and options that exist, uh, there comes upon the human mind and the physicality, spirituality, and emotional perception, why am I here? Like, mm -hmm. if this is just a game, right? If I create my own illusions, right? right you know, is it worth being there? How do you uh, create a solution for that objection of, yeah, if everything's BS, then, you know, I should get rid of this limitation and just move on to something bigger and better because I do have faith there's something bigger and better and it loves me more. What am I doing here? Right. Um, that's that's deep. <laughs> I saved the best one for last. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and it is is deep because um, I do believe that, you know, it is BS belief systems. Uh, and you can choose, I, I guess, if you are convinced that if you do take your own life, that you'll move on to something bigger and better then you're you're in a tough spot. But me personally, I believe that if everything is BS and I get to make it up, then I get to make up the best version of it. And I know that I can create heaven here on earth. Why take the risk? Nobody has gone to heaven. Nobody has died, gone to heaven, come back and said, hey, yo, it's lit. <laughs> yo, it's lit. <laughs> you might as well, you know what I'm saying? Because that kind of, it kills the idea of heaven if you can just go to hit a button and go there. Um, but we know, we see people living heavenly lifestyles here on earth. And if uh, uh, a strong relationship with yourself is all that it takes to get there in a lot of cases, then pff, why not? You know, and, and then you have the journey and the journey is fun. You know, it's, it's just for me, it's just so many benefits to uh, believing that I can create heaven here on earth. Well, you have the recipe to spice up life, that's for sure. Thomas Spicer, he is the magic man, the expert of BS, that's belief systems, because he creates his own, not only for himself, but for you. That's why he's offering also his book to you. So make sure you reach out to Tomage. He's an extraordinary leader and someone who can help you and empower you be happy and live the BS system that you want to live. Thank you, Tomage, so much for joining me.